What's up, sons? It's Blind Run with Son of a Tech once again, and it's been almost over a week, or actually over a week since I did my last video. I wanted to clarify real quick that yes, the 7700K is deleted and the video is coming very soon, but for today, we're going to sit back and take a look at the Zotac GTX 1050, and we're going to see how it performs and even if it's worth it to be purchasing a graphics card at that kind of price point, so stick around. Alrighty, so hopping right into it, the test bench is going to be an i7 6700K, overclocked to 4.8 gigahertz, and that's going to be mated to an MSI Z170 SLI Pro, or SLI Plus is what I should say, motherboard with 16 gigabytes of DDR4 memory, and that's clocked at 2400 megahertz, and everything's running on a scan disk 500 gigabyte solid state drive, and my AX860i actually took a shit, so we are actually on a thermal take, and that's an 850 watt power supply. Super, super upset about that, but hopefully we'll get some RMA through or something like that. Alright, so taking a look at the card here, you'll see that we have a single HDMI 2.0B with a single DisplayPort 1.4 port and a single Dual Link DVI. So it's going to have all that kind of connectivity that you need, especially considering that you probably don't really want to be running too many multi monitor setups unless it's just purely for productivity and maybe something like Excel spreadsheets across like 10 or 20 monitors or something like that because people do that. Anyways, all right, so obviously we're looking at this for gaming. It's gonna be coming in maybe like typically about $10 more than the RX 462 gigabyte. So we're gonna be comparing it to that in the charts. Of course, if we look around the card some more, you'll see that we have a pretty basic heatsink design. And on top of that, we have a black fan with a black fan shroud over that cooler. It does kind of have a gap and it does only look to be a single slot from the outside of the PC, but you need to keep in mind that on the inside of the PC, you're still looking at a dual slot kind of room that you're gonna need. It is kind of interesting that they didn't actually take up the dual slot on the actual PCI rails from the outside on your case mounting, but that's a good thing because there are certain scenarios where in many ITX cases that you might only wanna take up a single one on the back for that. The other thing that's nice about that is you could feasibly replace the cooler on it and make it a full on single slot slot card and because this card doesn't use any extra power as we move around the card you'll see that that slot is missing there it actually only takes about 55 watts now because it only takes about 55 watts at load this also means that it stays pretty cool so let's talk about that real quick if we go ahead and leave it at the stock fan profile when it comes out of the box running we see that the max temperature during fire strike stress test and that's 20 passes essentially the stock standard fire stress test we only saw 51 degrees Celsius if we go ahead and bump the fan speed up to 60% which is constant through that entire stress test we see a maximum kind of temp of 50 degrees Celsius now if we bump it all the way up to hundred percent we get all the way down to 46 degrees Celsius now that's about in a pretty hot room I'm at 80 degrees Fahrenheit which I think comes out to like 25 to 27 degrees Celsius correct me if I'm wrong my math might be off there, but it's about that. So it's a pretty warm room as is, and we're staying pretty cool on the card under load. So now that we've talked about the temperatures for the various fan speeds, let's go ahead and top into a fan speed noise test, and you guys can see or hear what it sounds like at the kind of stock setting or which is gonna be about 40%, the 60% setting and the 100% setting. So let's go ahead and check that out right now. Stick around.
So with these temperatures, I felt perfectly fine going ahead and cranking the power limit all the way up and the thermal limit all the way up and seeing what we could get on the overclock. Unfortunately, this card didn't really show or prove to be kind of in that Pascal line of bumping up over 2000 megahertz like we see with the GTX 1060 and 1070 and even 1080. And unfortunately, we only hit about 1961 megahertz, but that's still respectable and that's at boost. I'm pretty happy with it. I was wasn't actually able to unfortunately get any sort of memory overclock which I did attempt to because at this kind of budget range you're trying to drag every little last piece of performance out of these GPUs to hopefully give you a better playing experience. That being said, if we hop into the synthetic benchmarks, you're gonna see that the Firestrike score was 7,521. And this beats out the competitor by like a thousand points, which is quite a bit. It's more than 10%. And the thing to note about that is that there is a 10% price bump from the RX 462 gigabyte to the GTX 1050, but you're seeing a more than 10% gain in performance, at least in synthetics. Now, if we bump up to Time Spy, which is gonna put us into that 1440p, it's obviously not playable. It's very jerky when you're watching Time Spy go through, and I wouldn't recommend playing in it, but you'll see that we get 2013, which is a good baseline just to know where we're at. And it does, once again, in synthetic benchmarks, beat out the RX 462 gigabyte. Here's where things start to get a little confusing though and a lot of this is because we're seeing a lot of games come out more recently that lean towards that AMD side and another thing that's super interesting is that pretty much as the drivers are maturing for the AMD side of things it's improving their entire line which is just incredible and unfortunately that doesn't make Nvidia look good here because we'll see in Rise of the Tomb Raider that it has a minimum FPS of 23.29 with an average of 48.95 and a max of 81.62. I mean you pretty much get the same performance albeit a little less but still in that 40 FPS range from the 462 gigabyte which is 23 FPS on the min with a 43.96 on the average and a max of 69.75 but that that being said, if you actually go in and feel like playability between the two games, the RX 460 feels smoother. And a lot of this is because the range of difference between the min frame rate and the max frame rate is not quite as far apart as it is with the 1050. So while the 1050 does have a better average and, and a better max, it doesn't play as smooth. That's something to keep in mind. If we bump over to Total War Warhammer with high settings at 1080p, which these are all pretty much recommended 1080p settings for both of these cards. I did make sure that they were the same, by the way. We had a minimum FPS of 33 with an average of 38.5 and a max of 41. Now, if we move over to the RX 460, we start to see the RX 460 winning, which I mean, we kind of knew would happen in Total War Warhammer, but we see a minimum FPS of 38, which with an average of 46.1 and a max of 51. Finally, in Gears of War 4, we saw that both cards have the same kind of time between frames, and this is in milliseconds. The GTX 1050 had 18.3 milliseconds, while the RX 460 had 18.1 milliseconds. Now, once we bump over to frame rates for Gears of War 4, we see that the minimum frame rate for the 1050 was 41.5, while in the RX 460, we saw 45.1. And on the 1050, we had an average of 54.7. And on the 460, we had an average of 55.4. So the 460 wins here again. Now, all of these games are now being played in kind of that DirectX 12 mode. And I did go ahead and test in the DirectX 11 mode in actually Total War, Warhammer, and Rise of the Tomb Raider. And the results weren't that much different. Another thing to note here is that when I say the results weren't different, the game, the, the card still scaled at the same kind of FPS. But the thing that made it different is that we got 
much worse performance in DirectX 11, at least in Rise of the Tomb Raider, on both of the cards. So DirectX 12 is pretty much helping out both companies equally here. And I realize you guys could say go check out The Witcher or Grand Theft Auto 5 or something like that. But I think you can see how that scaling in the fire strike score i think it's more important to show you guys where we're moving towards as we move forward with these new cards and what the newer games are and and these are the newer games right now i mean you're not having very many games come out with it aren't supporting like vulcan or DirectX 12 or supporting you know the the kind of evolution of the amd drivers that have been coming out so it's been pretty impressive to see amd gain some ground there especially in this range where the budget you would lean towards saying okay okay, well, I'll spend $10 more and get a card that performs better in these synthetic benchmarks. But on a day-to-day -day gaming basis, I think you save the $10 and you grab yourself an RX 460. That's just my opinion. Let me know what your opinion is in the comment section below. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe as well. And as always, I will see you next Tuesday.